Hey carnivores, welcome back to the channel. It's me, Bella the Steak and Butter Gal. I hope you all are having an amazing meat fuel day. And as always, drop your update down below in the comments. If you know anything about the carnivore diet, then you probably know a thing or two about Dr. Paul Saladino. Dr. Saladino was one of my earliest carnivore diet inspirations and a big reason why I went carnivore too. He was one of the first people to share information and content about the carnivore lifestyle alongside Dr. Sean Baker and Dr. Candy Berry. While Dr. Saladino's meat-centric diet has raised many eyebrows in the general non-carnivore population for many years now, it is his reintroduction of fruit, carbs, and honey into his diet that has left us carnivores with more questions than answers. So in today's video, we are teaming up with Dr. Tony Hampton to answer the burning question. What did Paul Saladino not tell us about reintroducing fruit and carbs into a carnivore diet? So let's get started. Dr. Hampton, welcome. Introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, happy to be here as usual. And I am a family obesity doc, a little extra training in nutrition and functional medicine because I felt like that would be helpful for me to help my patients heal. I'm in Chicago uh, and uh, I primarily see older patients, uh, but I focus on obesity medicine as well, metabolic health. And uh, it's been really great to help people heal by applying those approaches to the practice. So thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited. And let me just introduce the SBG team that is here right now. Hi, I'm Emily Harbo. I coach in the SBG. I've lost 150 pounds with carnivore and fasting, and I just love to be here to encourage people in their low carbon carnivore lifestyle. My name is Nazan. I've uh, been coaching here for about uh, four years. I'm glad to have you here, uh, Dr. Hempton, to hear from your expertise. I'm Bachness. I'm an admin with SBG, and I have a YouTube channel called the Carnivore Cure, and I lost about 260 pounds with carnivore and have ridded myself of anxiety and depression, a lot of things, and uh, glad to be talk with you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rochelle. I have been a coach for almost five years, and I coach in the Steak and Butter Gang as well. I came to carnivore because I wanted to get pregnant and have a baby, and I was successful. <laughs> and just so grateful to be here with you. Hi, my name is Jeff Pujero. I've been with the Steak and Butter Gang for two years. I am so grateful that Bella has established this. I'm so happy they've done so much for me. I can't say enough about it. Good everyone. I'm Keith. Uh, I'm from New Zealand and I've been a carnival for one year and uh, I've been with the Steak and Butter Gang for one year. I really love being part of SBG. Great to see you, Dr. Hampton. So Dr. Hampton, my first question for you is, can you share your initial reaction when you heard about Dr. Paul Saladino incorporating fruit into his carnivore diet? Yeah, I appreciate that question. And uh, I still have the carnivore code uh, as one of my favorite books. So nothing but love for Dr. Saladino. And because we need resources, we need our patients and ourselves to have resources. When I started my journey, I had to look at somebody who was doing this before me and finding a fellow doctor who could remove some of the myths that concerned me that I had been taught was very important. So I really appreciate him for doing that. Uh, I do try to look at the world through the lens of a scientist. And, uh, when, when, and as a scientist, you have to be willing to change your perspective when you acquire new information, right? So if, if the doc's life experiences let him down a new path. You have to respect that. But when that happens, then those who follow him are like, well, maybe I need to ask why, right? So, so I was really curious about why he made that change. And, and I really think it's important that we have uh, voices that are so impactful like his to be, be, you know, be nuanced and caveat. So I think if I were to make a wish, I would say whenever you're um, sharing information, that's a little different uh, to be nuanced so that those who may not fit the profile that it works for, maybe in his case, those people who particularly who are not metabolically healthy, right? They need to understand how that may impact them. So I think that nuance needs to be added to the equation, just like when a study comes out. Uh, can we put nuance out there? Who does this apply to? Who shouldn't mm -hmm. it apply to? Who should be more cautious? So, so I was a little surprised, but I'm definitely not afraid to hear new uh, perspectives because that's how we grow. If we don't question our conventional thinking, then we will not change when we 
are in a position where we may need to change. So, so I'm actually okay with it. And I think it's great because now we can have conversations like this. I love the connecting piece. Um, that's why it's so wonderful to have Dr. Hampton every month in our challenge because he's the ultimate connector because he's out there treating actual patients every single day. When I come to it, I just come from my personal experience is that fruit would lead to cookies, would lead to processed food, would lead to, would lead to, would lead to. And so I, I can't consider that uh, for myself. My blood sugar goes crazy. Yeah. My cravings come back and it does not suit my carnivore lifestyle. Yeah. You know, uh, I actually like that uh, Saladino did explore that and I read his book and, you know, I, I saw how anti-fruit he was in his book. That was kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But it started to make me think because, you know, as a coach, I coach some people that have a hard time getting into carnivore. And that's where I have the banana trick, for example. And I found out just recently, I have a client that the banana didn't work for him but watermelon did. And I started asking myself, wait a minute, why? What's going on here? So I looked up what he was having problems was uh, he, he was getting wheezy and unable to breathe uh, when he was eating just carnivore. And so it dawned on me, L-citrulline, because watermelon has a lot of citrulline. For some reason, he's not getting this enough in the meats. So could it be an amino acid shortage? And I don't know the answer to that. I looked it up and sure enough, citrulline helps with the lungs. And I'm mm -hmm. like, so wow. is there something with the amino acids, but for some reason, some of us don't digest it properly. I would definitely comment on that to say, uh, a lot of the men that come see me, uh, they're encouraged to uh, use L-citrulline, uh, which then converts to arginine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it causes, uh, you know, vasodilation. So it's really good for uh, erectile dysfunction and and to open up those blood vessels in general via ultimately nitric oxide. So uh, yeah, I think that uh, that's a nice nuance. That's going to the nuance, right? So we right. we now have a little nuance that may explain why that's beneficial. And uh, and for some people, uh, that's okay as long as the negative effects of the sugar that comes with that product is yes. not harmful, right? And I right. think that's the key. And I'll say from when I first got pregnant, I craved fruit. I, I've never liked watermelon in my entire existence. But when I got mm. pregnant, all of a sudden, boom, I caught myself leaving the grocery store with a mini personal watermelon and I ate the whole thing. Did I have negative mm. side effects from it? Yes, because I eat carnivore. <laughs> but it was just really interesting to me to break down what it was that I needed to Raymond's point about amino acids nutrient wise. And I looked it up and it was lycopene. And I, because I had never eaten an egg, so I was I was craving lycopene, which is very essential, as you would know, Dr. Hampton, for the development of the fetus. Um, mm -hmm. And so it went from watermelon to tomatoes, and then both of those things just were out after the first couple of weeks. They were they were out for me. Um, but I just think it's very interesting that this could potentially arise for some people, and I understand that pregnancy is a completely different beast. <laughs> Well, I just think there's going to be a rush on meat plus watermelon with all this talk about vasodilation. I know, right? <laughs> Everything is happening. Like, so anyways, that I, I just think y'all caused a little revolution. That's all. Uh, I remember uh, Dave Chappelle did a skit and he said, if you don't like uh, watermelon, something wrong with you. So it's, it's definitely, he did. It's so funny. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, oh, hey. So, um, hey, I'm, I understand. So, you know, again, right. uh, many carnivores have their, you know, even I heard Sean Baker say, He's 98% carnivore. That means every once in a while, you know, so mm. that's not going to, that's not going to hurt you. It's when you go over and above. So I think that's totally okay. What do you believe are the main reasons behind Paul Saladino's decision to incorporate fruit and honey back into his carnivore diet? I know one of the things he talked about was uh, cramping. And, uh, and it's interesting because cramping is something that can happen if your electrolytes are off, anytime you're doing a lower carb dietary pattern or keto, and of course, carnivore, there's an issue. So if there's an issue, then of course, when you think about those uh, athletes, right, the sweating, the ultra athletes, I consider him an ultra athlete, at least from the picture and all oh, wow. of that surfing he's doing. Mm -hmm. If he's not one, then he should be one. Um, and, and so what do they say about that? You have people like Dr. Steve Finley, who says, well, if you're um, if you're if you're needing to go low carb and doing that, you're, you may need five to seven 
uh, grams of salt every day. And that'll freak out the cardiologist. But the reality is that's what happens with your body. Now, imagine what that means for Dr. Paul Saladino and people like that. They may need even more salt. Mm -hmm. And maybe there was a disconnect between how much he needed and, uh, you know, from the electrolyte. So why not just add some of the fruit, which will then reduce the loss of electrolytes by, you know, so I think it makes sense for him. And, and it makes sense that he would cramp. He also talked about sleep and that he was having problems with sleep. And of course, if your electrolytes are not in balance, you're probably going to have uh, trouble, not just with sleep in general, but the quality of your sleep. So even when you're sleeping, the quality won't be as good. And people who don't get uh, uh, when your electrolytes are off, you're not just having problems at night, you're having problems during the day, you're feeling restless. Uh, surprisingly, the thing that surprised me the most is this issue with low T. Does Dr. Saladino look like you have a testosterone problem? No, no way, definitely right. not. And, and when hmm. we think about carnivore, we actually think carnivore actually boosts your testosterone. We think about all the higher fat diets because the so in order to get to uh, testosterone, you need to have cholesterol and fat in your diet. So, and that's why people who eliminate uh, fat in their diet, particularly plant-based, they struggle with low uh, testosterone. So, so what's cool about carnivore, which is why it's so surprising this happened to them, is that with carnivore, you eliminate the inflammatory foods, the sugars, the grains, the vegetable oils, the fibers, the plant toxins. You get rid of all of that stuff. All of those things can actually lower your testosterone when they're present, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have more dietary fat in your diet, which is good for your testosterone. And so you have all of these beneficial results. More importantly, so you're, so you're eliminating stuff, but you're also adding the stuff that's helpful. So, uh, and I've seen this happen to my plant-based patients all the time. They struggle sometimes with their zinc level. But you need zinc in order to increase, you know, have an adequate testosterone level. And you can get that zinc in ribeye, lamb, and, and uh, ground beef and things like that. The other thing you think about is the B12. We know what happens when you go plant-based. Uh, mm -hmm. The B12 tends to be an issue that lowers your testosterone. Well, when you eat uh, ribeye, liver, and things like that, you're going to get your B12. And of course, the vitamin D level is important in salmon and uh, things like that. So I just think that it's surprising that his testosterone level went down. But um, I would argue that carnivore is the perfect diet for that. So, and again, this is why it's so important that we individualize. And when you see there's an issue, uh, you need to kind of go backwards and say, well, what caused the issue? And, and, and in my household, particularly my mom, anytime something goes wrong with me, she says that carnivore diet. <laughs> but the oh, reality is that's not always the answer, right? Shout out to my right. mom. That's not always the answer. Sometimes there's other issues there that can help us, you know, deal with these issues. And maybe it was not enough fat. You know, there's other things that may have explained things. And I think that when you're doing this experiment, you're not always looking at all the possibilities. Yeah. So I love that, that you're, you're pointing that out and all of his description that you just described sounds like, just like what we see with people over fasting, not eating enough. Now, if he's working out that much, and that's what I always suspected was his issue. And mm -hmm. he's also eating a lot of lean meat, like you said, very low fat. So I was like, oh, not lean meat organs because he's all in about organs and those are lean. Mm -hmm. So he's not getting his right. fat in. So that's why I think he went that route. Because let me tell you, because he went that route doesn't mean, I mean, I'm, I'm a six years in right now. Mm -hmm. uh, we know people who's been at it for longer than that, much longer than that, and they don't have this issue. So why him? I just think he's taxing his body too much and was yeah. under eating. Yeah. So thank you. Great. I do think less is more. Uh, Dr. Bimbo Kikio you know, what his exercise program teaches us that sometimes less exercise is better. And obviously, uh, when you're surfing, things like that is more passion and something that you get a ton out of besides just exercise. But but yeah, I mean, when I was a tennis player, um, I would be out there all day long. I'm going to tell you, we had to keep pushing it in. And it takes a lot to kind of find balance. And, and you could also argue, is this a normal thing you know it's just like a marathon is it really normal to run a marathon is it normal for me to be out playing tennis literally all day and sweating all day so i think when we tax our bodies like that we're likely to then move you know move into this place where we're starting to have negative effects see the, the problem with higher in athletic folk like i had a patient today who used to be a bodybuilder they 
have to tweak things and pay attention to things, just like a type one person with diabetes, right? Mm -hmm. They have to pay attention to everything and little changes have big impacts. So for him, uh, if he were to start to increase the fat and he would have to really start to measure stuff and it gets really nuanced. I think for the average person that we talk to, uh, it's not necessary to do all of those things until they struggle. So, and, and when they struggle, it's usually not going to be at that level. So I do think that if he had a gone down to increase the fat uh, in his diet, and obviously we're not talking to him directly, maybe he did, I think that he may have found some solutions there, at least for part of what he was struggling with. So, but you know, you never know. Whatever the process is for gluconeogenesis healed in my body and it became more efficient after 15 mm -hmm. months of doing carnivore. Mm -hmm. And so I had to up the fat. And when I did, that greatly helped my testosterone. But also what it did at the same time was it helped it. Uh, I couldn't absorb as much protein without having a glucose spike. So where I used to be able to eat maybe uh, 80, 90 grams of protein in a meal, I couldn't do that anymore. I could only eat about 60 to 70 grams of protein without spiking my insulin. And so the, so when I raised the fat, my uh, testosterone went up, but I stopped having uh, calf cramps and stuff. I, I now I can't raise my protein level without having gluconeogenesis, but I feel far better. So I was just curious about that because when I have gluconeogenesis, I get anxiety back and I, I get irritable. I don't sleep well and I get, uh, uh, I get crampy. So I just thought that was kind of interesting on that fat talk because that seemed to be the answer for me for sure. How much did you lose weight wise? I'm at 278 now. Just an wow. amazing number. Right. That's, amazing. Right. Wow. That's insane. Amazing. So yeah. And, and all of that insulin resistance that existed at those higher weights, um, it is, uh, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a journey because it's never quite gone away. And I think you'll always have to fight that. And that's why, and it's also easier to kind of go backwards, right? So if you lost the support of the group or you had some traumatic life experience, uh, you would easily slide back. So, so I think for you, it's going to be so important to recognize that uh, my body is, you know, even though the numbers may look like my fasting insulin and all of those things we measure may look okay, you're always more prone to uh, sliding back. So just so it's a it's a it's a motivation in terms of knowing what you need to do, but it sure. also just reminds you that my body may react in a way that the other person it's kind of unfair won't. So, but yeah, I think I'm not surprised that there's still some struggles because you're you're not quite as you've still got a little bit of that resistance still there. And I think that's why there's still some struggle. That's fine though. I tell people, you know, people that say carnivore is restrictive. I'm like, if, if, if you're talking to a guy that was paralyzed and all they had to do was eat <laughs> bacon and eggs to be able to right. walk again, they would never say that that was a restrictive trade-off. And that's right. how I feel about it. So but thank you so much. I agree. To me, it's all about where we came from. And so I came from at 300 pounds was absolutely morbidly obese, was size 4X, 28, pretty miserable in that size. I was remembering a certain glucometer reaction that I had to strawberries where strawberries just sent it like, boom, just wild. It's spring wow. season right now. People are asking, what can I have that's cool and fresh? And fruity and all those things. But I love what you said. We have to look at it in context. We have to look at it to our individual biology. And I love what Todd's saying that I, you know, am so happy to have a new life. And if part of that means that, hey, if I slip backwards, get out of the community, lose support, that's going to get me really quickly, then keeping that awareness is really important to, yeah. to protect my lifestyle, to protect right. my health. It must be protected. I love Dr. Saladino's Instagram page because he provides so much information and education for the world, especially people who just don't get a carnivore diet lifestyle. Mm -hmm. He makes it easy to digest. And what I've noticed is Dr. Saladino, he lives on a tropical island. He mm -hmm. lives in Costa Rica. He gets sunlight every day and he gets seasonal fruit, right? And he's also surfing three hours a day. Can you talk about maybe the dangers of, let's say, having a nine to five job? getting fruit that is imported, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of living the way that Saladino lives, what's the difference if we try to mimic his diet? It's highly likely that some of the fruit he's, he has access to has not been genetically modified. So 
Uh, mm -hmm. If it's not genetically modified, that means that the uh, sweetness of it won't be the same as it is in genetically modified fruit. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, he has the resources of a, uh, I don't know his resources, but he's a doctor and he probably has more resources than my average patient. Right. Therefore, the possibility that they'll be able to buy uh, grass fed, you know, whatever, even though we're talking about fruit here, um, I, I just don't think that the average person in that environment will be able to uh, afford those fruits. So, so, so if you were to say, yes, if I'm going to try to eat uh, fruit from uh, plants that are maybe better for me, um, I think that getting to that type of uh, product is going to be very difficult and it may never be possible on a mass scale. Therefore, um, it may make more sense for most people to uh, weigh the benefits versus the risk. Now, if the benefit is extraordinary, um, you know, I fly planes, you know, I get on planes, I, I think the benefit outweigh the risk, you know. But if right. I had heard uh, on the news every other night that planes are falling out of the sky, I would probably get on a bus <laughs> and do it that way. And I just think that for most people who live in this country, 7% uh, of U.S. citizens are metabolically healthy based on the research at Tufts University, which means mm -hmm. that 93% uh, aren't. And it also means that in communities of color, it may not be 7% that are metabolically healthy. It's probably down to 3 4%. So mm -hmm. in those settings, whether it's the country or individuals, uh, it is not likely that we'll be able to do what he does mm -hmm. uh, beyond the athletic part, beyond the genetics that he may have that are maybe supporting. I see families come to my clinic and like everybody's overweight and 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 yes, some of that is lifestyle. Maybe most of it is, but but man, when you're fighting those genetics, you're fighting the culture and everything else that makes it challenging. It is very difficult to imagine that that person should be consuming a lot of fruit. And so it's much easier to encourage them to eat what's essential to life. Fruits uh, are not essential. Carbs are not essential. Let's eat the protein and let's eat the fat. And then periodically, just like Winnie the Pooh, we may come across some honey. There you go. <laughs> Shout out to Winnie the Pooh, my favorite little character when I was a kid. And in those settings, a few a couple of times a year, why not have a little honey? But doing it every day, every other day, doing fruit every day, every other day is not a yeah. is not a decision most of the people we are trying to serve should make. And and again, if we can say that out loud and remind people that if you fit this demographic and you are maybe younger and you are maybe able to be athletic, if you are, mm -hmm. you know, if you're in that category, then this may work for you. In fact, you may do better. You may, you know, fill your glycogen stores, you know, as you get ready to lift the weights. And I think that's okay. But for most people, uh, they won't have access to the right fruit. And if they did, it's probably still not a good idea. What could be essential to a lot of new carnivores, including those transitioning from a keto diet, is leaning on a high quality electrolyte supplement. This is the one that I recommend. It's from the brand Element and very specifically this teal colored box that they offer. It is labeled raw unflavored. And this one has no stevia, no sugar, nothing but the three electrolytes our body needs. You just rip one open, pour it in whatever you're drinking, mix it up, drink it down, and you are good to go. You all can get a free sample pack like this, which includes the raw unflavored. If you go to the URL shown on the screen, drinklmnt.com slash S-B-G-A-L. I've also linked them down below. I do want to respect the fact that we can use a fruit as a potential medicine or potential helper as a tool, not obviously as a food. In a way, I say medicine, but you know what I mean? Just to get us that hump that we need. That's 100% true. Um, I I look at those non-essential fruit, the non-essential herbs as a form of medicine. And as we just talked about, um, citrulline, which is in the watermelon, uh, watermelon pill, can then be a source of medicine. Yes. So it's okay to take that supplement if you uh, struggle with 
uh, erectile dysfunction as an example. But then I also tell my patients, why do you have erectile dysfunction, right? right. You don't, you never, you weren't born necessarily with a citrulline deficiency. You're not a watermelon, right? right? So, so the, so the, and, and what I say is, and this is the part that they are amazed at, I say, it's a muscle down there. Can we now recommend something to get that muscle working again? And it may be a pump, not necessarily the one a urologist recommends, something that's like a form of exercise every two mm -hmm. to three days. So, to my shock and amazement, when I recommend pumps that people can buy direct to consumer themselves, FDA approved, men recovering, guess what? All of a sudden, they don't need Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. All of a sudden, they don't even need the citrulline supplement because yes. they've restored it. And, and then they get on a maintenance schedule. So that's really important that people understand root cause, root cause, root cause. Yes. If I can get to that and fix it, then I may not need supplements in the form of herbs and fruit and or medicine. But, and if I can't get off the medicine, that's okay. If I have to take the supplement, that's okay. But we're always striving towards being as, you know, ancestral appropriate because they didn't have any of this stuff back in the day, right? <laughs> so let's try to do it that way. I agree. And I love that you mentioned root cause, finding out what the root cause is. Usually these things, as you know, working in a clinical setting, the way that you do these symptoms that people are experiencing are a symptom of a root cause. And it's like, right. if you want to change the fruit, you need to change the root, <laughs> you know, to use that well, cheesy analogy. Uh, and I agree, like, for me, a lot of the root cause was insulin resistance, a lot of it was inflammation. Um, and just on to touch on the honey subject, I, I would be nervous to reintroduce it much to Emily, Emily's point about, you know, just recovering from sugar and binge eating, restricted binge eating, volume eating, like, I feel like it would just open a doorway for me. However, I do understand that it does have a place and a role as a form of medicine. I mean, I've used it mixed with salt on my on my skin, and it's done amazing things oh, yeah. for me. However, ingesting it, I would be concerned that it would potentially bring back, you know, chronic arthritic pain or something like that. So yes, for me, yeah. I like I would have to really you know, weigh my options, benefit, risk, benefit, risk, but what is the root cause? And, and, you know, starting with that, I think is the most important part. I'm so glad this was brought up the carb addiction, sugar addiction aspect. I know myself and my past, if something triggers me, the binge eating will come back. If something mm -hmm. triggers me, then I don't feel like I'm in control with my food habits and with my eating patterns. Yes. So I would love to just quickly go around the room and have you guys share real quick why do you not eat fruits and honey? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, and well, it's, some of it is not even me, it's my wife, right? So my wife has uh, type 1 diabetes. And I don't believe that she can tolerate the uh, spikes. Um, and even Dr. Saladino believes that the spikes can be helpful because we need some insulin to help us hold on to the salt um, and the minerals. And, uh, but my theory is, you know, you're gonna get a little bit of a spike from the protein. So if you're concerned about the insulin signal going to sleep and you're getting, you know, physiologic insulin resistance, uh, I don't think that that's a big issue because when you get insulin resistance temporarily because you're not really needing the insulin, your body just bounces right back. Mm -hmm. So the benefit of um, not getting that is greater than any benefit of consuming fruit. I don't, I don't really need that. My wife doesn't need that. And for me, although fruit is more tolerated than the the, the uh, asper you know, not the asparagus, but for me, it was like the Brussels sprouts, the cabbage and things of that nature. Fruit's more tolerated, but it, as a person who had stomach problems, mm -hmm. um, irritable bowel, uh, the first day of the watermelon, shout out to Dave Chappelle again, the first day of that's going to be great. But, yeah. but then if I kept eating that, we're going to have a problem. And I don't sure. want to go back to eating what I consider the poison that led to my symptoms because busy right. life, I need to have a stomach that's happy. So for me, 
it was really more about my wife, but I also saw in myself that it was much better when I avoided fruit. So for me, it has a lot to do with those same things. It's protecting the current health that I've achieved. I worked really hard to make it this far. I took a lot of focus in my life to get here. And it is so good being here. I feel my optimal. My hormones feel great. I have awesome hunger satiety signals. I don't think about food. It's mm. so efficient. I have food freedom. So I can just work through my days and not think about food. And it helps me to be able to fast easily. Uh, so I'm just so happy where I'm at and I don't crave it at all. So there's just for me, no reason to include it. When I have any fructose or sugar or any of that stuff, first thing that happens is anxiety comes back. And that anxiety has always been the really just the crux of of all my compulsive behavior and addictive nature. Mm -hmm. And I've always treated anxiety with uh, sugar and always trying to find something. I, I, I've kind of, I really truly believe that most of uh, my addiction it's, uh, to food and gambling and everything in my past mm -hmm. was, and, and uh, my compulsive nature was just some sort of weird trying to trying to find some relief from the constant torment from anxiety for like 30 years. And as soon as that comes back, I know when I get anxiety, that is a hundred percent. It's, it's just poison for me. It's just going to, it's going to ruin me. So I got to keep that gone. You know, that the depression comes with the anxiety and always having to self-medicate with something, uh, you know, to a really compulsive extreme measure. And that's what it always was. When the anxiety went away, everything else was easily melted away. And that didn't happen until I was completely away from all, anything that spikes my insulin. It seems like if I spike my insulin, something happens with cortisol and the anxiety goes through the roof. I'll, I'll comment uh, briefly, Todd. Um, I think the lesson learned is, you, you said, is it the insulin spike? Is it something else. Uh, it may be that you're out of ketosis. All, what, what we know for sure is that there are certain people who, to the extent they can, should try to stay in ketosis or at least close to that. And one of those areas is clearly mental health. Mm -hmm. If you have mental health issues, let's try to be a little bit more nuanced and stay in that zone. Dr. Georgia E., Dr. Chris Palmer would agree, I'm sure. You, you also want to think about any type of neurodegenerative disease, the dementias and the Huntington's diseases. I think that's another category you want to kind of, ep epilepsy is a no brainer, you, mm -hmm. you know, and then we start leaning towards autoimmune diseases as well. So there are certain categories of folk who have healed with keto and carnivore who need to be more prescriptive with it. I don't think a person with diabetes or hypertension necessarily have to be that, you know, prescriptive, but with mental health stuff, it's just not worth it. Mm, and no. Nobody wants to go back into that place they were. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. No, I mean, this is, this is not restrictive because that side's so bad. This is a blessing to have an option. So yeah. If you're new to the carnivore lifestyle and you're feeling overwhelmed, lost, or just alone in your carnivore journeys, I welcome you all to join my community, the Steak and Butter Gang. We host 30-day carnivore challenges every single month in the community to make sure that all the members are inspired, well-informed, and on track. Every single week, I feature and bring on amazing carnivore doctors, including Dr. Tony Hampton, as well as Dr. Anthony Chafee, Dr. Robert Kilt, Coach Rebecca Heishman, and so many more amazing carnivore experts so that our members can ask their burning questions and get the help and troubleshooting they need. You also have regular access to learn and troubleshoot with my amazing team of carnivore coaches. Most of them are featured in today's video. Check out the Steak and Butter Gang challenges at the URL shown on the screen, sbgmeetup.com, or check out the description box for a clickable link. First of all, I don't crave fruits. Um, I don't crave honey, but I can tell you this. Last year, I was part of a, a group, uh, the Healthy American Still Am. They found a jar of honey that's 50 years old. It was black as molasses. And I tasted that and I lit up. I don't know if it was to ferment or what. And I just couldn't stop myself. I just wanted more. And I reached out for more. And I'm like, but normally honey doesn't do that for me. But this one did. And I was like, what is going on? So it's interesting. But no, as far as me, I don't even have the desire for these things. I, des I wanted that one because it was a 50-year-old honey. I was like... 
I'm going to try this. How often am I going to get that kind of chance? All right. Right. So that's why I tasted it. But I had no idea that would lead to uh, an addictive component that Emily was talking about. People even remarked, well, I thought you were a carnivore. I was like, yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> I, I guess not for this one. <laughs> Dr. Hampton, do you consider honey to be carnivore? Uh, I do not. Um, I, I understand um, that... Uh, you know, as we like to describe it, the vomit came from some type of animal. <laughs> uh, but I just think, uh, no, I, I just can't like uh, look at it that way at all. Um, it just doesn't make sense if we ate the bee and it was, we were talking about the bee itself, mm -hmm. maybe yes, consider yes. it. But I just think that's stretching it a little too far. Um, and it's and because it behaves so different compared to other animal products, I think we have to kind of factor that in. So it's a little, and again, I never would demonize a person who can tolerate it. And if you're metabolically healthy and you can tolerate it, have at it. But for oh. me, um, I'm not really, you know, a little bit of that is just when does it end? I mean, that stuff right. is, it's just so good. Mm, and right. you just never want to stop eating it. And I just have other stuff to do, you know, other things to do with my time instead of thinking about honey all day. Mm -mm. Agreed. <laughs> I agree. I choose not to eat fruits and honey for a slew of reasons. Uh, like I said, when I got pregnant, there was a craving period and there was just nothing I could do about it. Right. Uh, those cravings are definitely all consuming. But I, once I realized and was able to isolate the specific nutrient, I was able to research, okay, what meats could I, you know, get this from and, and what can I ingest that's going to be actually tolerable to me because there were a lot of aversions at the beginning of my, my pregnancy. Um, but for me, much like Todd, uh, anytime I would binge eat on sugar, I would get really, really anxious and followed by that high anxiety would be a crash and I would be manically depressed, you know, like within a few hours of my, my binge of my sugar, I would go from that super duper high to that super duper low. And it just really reinforced the dysfunction and dysregulation in my nervous system. And once I realized that those things played a key role, even though fruit is different than, you know, say Oreos or something like that, it still reacts in my body the same way. I still have the same response mentally and emotionally to those things. So not having them in, in my system is better for me. And this is ironic because like we have bees, like we keep bees and do honey and stuff at our house. And, and I love to give it away to people, you know, because it's, it's a way to bless people, but it's, it's just not something that I feel I need to consume for my health, at least not at this time. People have stated my reasons. I would count mental health among them. And I don't even consider honey, and this is just an opinion, but I don't consider honey as an animal product. If there were only two kingdoms, plant and animal, then okay, they have to go into that. But the world is not that black and white. So animals are insects. So if I ate grasshoppers, sure, I'd get protein, but I can get protein from broccoli or cauliflower. That doesn't mean I'm eating meat. So it's not carnivore. I so even sympathize with Todd on the anxiety aspect of it because when I quit vaping a year and a half ago and I went to Dairy Queen once and that led to three months, a 55 weight gain, a 55 pound weight gain, it took me another five months to lose it. My anxiety, depression, everything skyrocketed. I do not, and I didn't have a sugar addiction before that, but I believe as Dr. Ifflin said, it was sugar addiction transfer or it was addiction yeah. transfer. So I don't want to go back. And like Coach Emily said, that's just weight gain. You're, you're just staring weight gain in the face. So my, my third reason it just doesn't make any sense. doesn't make any sense. I've learned to really... Uh, love myself, right? And like a respectful way. This is God's temple. I want to take care of it. I have a responsibility. The healthier I am, the more service I can be to others. So I need to just keep all of these in mind and mm -hmm. stay carnivore. Again, as Coach Raymond said, because I feel good, because it makes me feel good. I wasn't feeling so great before. So for all of those reasons and probably others, that's why I just don't want to go near it. When I was younger, 
fruit and and honey i i really liked you know maybe because i was active or as i grew into an adult those wants for fruit and honey started disappearing and i was like wow why is that and then i realized that i had replaced it with carbs of another kind uh. like bread and then i had uh replaced it also as an adult uh with stuff like alcohol Mm -hmm. And then those things mm -hmm. triggered um, mental health issues for me. And uh, I didn't know what to do with it. So now that I see fruit and honey, I'm like, I need to stay away from it. Or, or anything that's in relation to that, uh, along with any carbs or sugars. That's the one thing I've learned on Carnival. And that's the one thing I've learned from the coaches and everybody here. If you if you really care about yourself and you really love yourself, <laughs> it, it, just give it a chance. Give Carnival a chance and see how it makes you feel about yourself. How do you respond to arguments suggesting that ancestral humans may have consumed small amounts of fruit and that it could have health benefits for some individuals? I think the key word is small amounts of fruit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I like, I'm glad you said that because... Um, I think that's what our ancestors had access to was small amounts of fruit. And, and just that alone should make you pause and say, okay, so if that's true, then should we then assume that all of this access to fruit that we have is normal? And the answer mm -hmm. is no, we all understand things can be seasonal, et cetera, but to suggest that, um, because they had access to that. And again, when you finally get access to the fruit, what logical person uh, is not going to enjoy that sweet taste, right? So I think for me, I think to assume that it's okay to periodically eat fruit for those who are not sugar addicted, processed food addicted, then that person, and I'm probably in that category, and even a person like me who's never had a weight problem, never really had, by definition, a sugar addiction or a processed food addiction as defined by Dr. Joan Iflin. Even a person like me, if you put a Snickers bar on my counter because it was Halloween week, mm. it's a good chance Dr. Hampton's going to struggle <laughs> walking by that Snickers bar. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good chance. So I told my wife, I love my wife. I bring her up often. Listen, let's not, first of all, why do we have dishes of candy in the house and we don't even have kids in here? What are we doing? <laughs> it's habit, right? right. So, but, but, but even a doctor and a person who doesn't have these problems, uh, you know, will struggle. So, <laughs> and, and we have to be careful when we start talking about ancestral and appropriate anything. I mean, we make a lot of assumptions when we talk about things that way. Yes. Sweet. We're just we're just throwing darts, we're guessing, and honestly, we're not even sure what we're talking about after a while. So so for me, it is even more important to not just assess what was ancestral apportionment. I'm looking at what's happening to this body right now. Right now. Yes. Because I have been genetically transformed compared to my ancestors. I, I am not the same guy or yes. gal that I was back then. So therefore, I need to make an assessment based on who I am today. And it may look different 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's important to look. We learn a lot from our past. We have a sense of our past. But at the end of the day, the exposure we had to fruits back then, hell in comparison, and I do not want any of my patients to spend so much hard work. If half the, first of all, half the fruit you buy ends up spoiling anyway, unless you are blessed to get those. I don't know if you guys ever bought those little green bags you can buy on Amazon that'll help preserve fruit. <laughs> Probably haven't done it lately because you're not no. really eating it, but, but back <laughs> in the day, you can get the green bags that uh, help you preserve fruit because it's so expensive, especially the ones that we say are okay, which are berries, right? But right. at the, but but why why would I spend all of my money and resources on something like that when it's not essential to life? Yes. It's basically just a source of uh, energy. The nu nutrient value 
on, on paper looks great, but you're not absorbing half the stuff. The right. fiber in it is not only, you know, going to inhibit some of that absorption, but it's also going to potentially, if it's too much fiber, make you bloat it. It may even increase uh, bacteria overgrowth, which is supposed to be helping your microbiome. It can make it worse. And of course, for a guy like me, gut inflammation. And oh, I can't for sure. tolerate that. And I, and again, I love my wife. I do not want to spend the whole night apologizing because I got <laughs> the gas. Seriously, right. it's just, right. and, 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 and I think it's funny, but literally, if I had to say one of the top five benefits of being a carnivore is that I just don't get gas. Yes. It's yeah. shocking. Now, that doesn't mean never. It just, because I'm, I'm just like we talked about how Todd may struggle with insulin resistance, right? I'm, I'm always going to have a stomach that's not I, optimal, right? So, so I'm always vulnerable. But mm. unless I, unless I'm, if I'm eating a ribeye, there's no, my stomach's just quiet. So I really love living in that place. And, and I, so I don't really, so I do want to learn from my ancestors, but I don't want to get caught up in that way of thinking, because I think what happens to this body now is what matters the most. I love when you're thinking about our social world, our social environment that, you know, sometimes we think, oh, it's so anti-social to eat carnivore. Well, for a lot of us with gas and trips to the bathroom and all this trouble, that's very anti-social <laughs> to include all that other stuff in there. Yeah. And having to think about it, right? Like you're, you're, you're sitting at the round table with your guests at an event and you're more concerned about where the bathroom is and mm -hmm. or trying Anxiety to get your legs crossed. Yeah. Right. It's stressful. Yeah. I just wanted to say that I really loved what you mentioned about, uh, you know, assessing our bodies now and yes. how we have to make a lot of assumptions about how our ancestors may or may not have lived. Um, because we don't exactly know the entire truth about what they may have eaten. Uh, there is a really interesting documentary that, uh, that I personally have watched, and it's called The Botany of Desire. And they actually talk about the manipulation and genetic modification of foods yes. and how they've done that. The slicing uh, of um, apples, how potatoes were traditionally very poisonous, and they've had to like crossbreed things to, you know, reduce the poisons, uh, the competition between, say, how sweet an apple is nowadays versus mm -hmm. how sweet apple juice is. And mm -hmm. I mean, to me, uh, that in itself is enough for me to be like, no, I'm not interested in that <laughs> because would you, would you potentially want to have eaten an apple from way back then in that documentary? Oh. It's very interesting because they share, you could go to one tree and there would be a thousand apples on it and each apple would taste different. So they would take the best tasting apples Oh. And the sweetest apples, and then they would mix those genetics to produce a sweeter apple, and they would continue to crossbreed and manipulate that in order to get the apple that we have today, which, mm -hmm. I mean, just blows my mind. It's And it's it's a very simple thing to do. And fruits back then were tiny, so you can't right. really overeat yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fruit is susceptible to hyperpalatability, to getting yeah. us all on the addictive foods, which are hyperpalatable. And so we can't even help that. They're designed to trick you. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. I but I, I love what you said, uh, uh, Dr. Hampton, because you're talking about, hey, let's focus on ourselves. First of all, they don't have the challenges that... Uh, our ancestors didn't have the challenges that we do in certain environment that we're living in. It is a difficult environment we are living in. Yes, don't get me wrong. Their environment was difficult too, but in a whole different aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, we have environmental pollution, just uh, the, the addictive foods, you work know, stress, all of those. Yeah. work stress. Yeah, exactly. Sure. So we have a whole different conversation at that point. Sure. What our conversation, like you're saying, is how can we be our best in this lifetime? That's all we can ask for. I love how you put that. So thank you. That's why I love Dr. Hampton. He says it best. Ah. Seriously. Well, first of all, I look forward to um, having a conversation with him. Uh, so that's one of the things we can look ahead to. And again, I, I, I love the fact that we'll always be able to talk with dignity and respect uh, because, again, he is doing exactly what we need. He's giving us an opportunity to vet our current belief systems. And I think it's so important that we do that because if we uh, fall into this rabbit hole and we can't see outside of it, we're not serving anybody. Uh, so the vigorous debate is uh, a, a great opportunity. And also 
um, it, it just helps us to clarify and say out loud that there is biodiversity out here and there is no perfect diet for anybody. So if we can just encourage people who hear our voices and ourselves to do our little experiment. And if you think about it, uh, in 2023, I was blessed to speak for the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. And the title of that presentation is how vegans and carnivores can live in harmony, right? Well, I honestly think that uh, carnivores who eat fruit can live in harmony with carnivores <laughs> who don't eat fruit. I really oh, believe that. I love that. I love that's that. so yeah. crucial. Yeah. So I love hug to Dr. Saladino yes. uh, for challenging our thinking, continuing to do a phenomenal. He's a smart guy, does great work, a lot of research. Maybe when I have more time, I'll do even more research. And uh, and I so I so so I think the future is bright because we're going to be comfortable having these debates. I think the future is bright because we're going to eventually have those randomized control trials that will then help define what a kind of wars, you know, metabolic profile should look like. That will define, you know, what little changes may be necessary when we struggle. So I just think that the future will be better because we're socializing. The work we're doing here is socializing mm -hmm. these terms so that People mm -hmm. understand what carnivore is. They know what metabolic health is, and they will not. They won't be afraid uh, to try this to heal. So, so I'm an optimist. I can't help it, but I honestly think that's what's going to happen. You're amazing, Dr. Hampton. We love you. We're so we love you so much. Time. Thank you so much for everything that you, Thank you. Thank deliver you. and share with our community, and just the way that you bless us with your your knowledge and your kindness and your warm heart. Thank your you, compassion is wonderful and endearing. So thank you for that, really. Connector, your connector. So the connector, good. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. thanks to all of you. I'm just happy I'm part of this community. So thank you for embracing me and giving me a okay. home away from my current home. So appreciate right. you. Dr. Hampton, I do want to give you a minute to promote yourself. So where can people find yeah. you? How can they work with you? All of that. Mm. This year is my year to write, but it's going to be... I'm going to take my nest and rope acronym, nutrition, mm -hmm. exercise, nest stress, you know, less stress, et cetera. And I'm going to find a patient that kind of fits each one of those. So I may have a person that's been through trauma for the T and we're going to talk about it. I'm going to write some stuff and then I'm going to talk about what do you do about it, right? So part of it is hmm. let's, let's understand why we struggle and, and give people permission to struggle but know that they can get out of that struggle. So the book will kind of, all it's always going to talk to what diet should be helpful, et cetera. But it's also about how do we overcome struggle while talking about this whole low carb keto and kind of our lifestyle. So that's kind of what I'm working on. I think it's always um, um, trying to get better, you know, finding time to make videos and stuff is where I'm focused. So I think, uh, anytime you see a, a video short, which is when I'm or a podcast, just comment, like, whatever, just to kind of keep that. Uh, as as uh, my my good friend Emily is starting that, it's hard out here for YouTube, <laughs> and we're learning from people like Bella and others how to do it. So so I think I would just put a little energy into the YouTube. Whenever you're around my channel, just say something. And I think that's where I would mm. put the energy and I'll keep trying to deliver good guests and good topics. And right now what I'm doing, just an FYI, I, I have to study to stay current as a family doctor. So instead of just focused on what we talk about, okay, like I just made a video about aortic aneurysms, right? So I'm just trying to put out videos mm. about health topics that I'm always wrapping it up with, oh, by the way, if you don't want to get one, maybe try this diet, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but so so when you see those videos out there, just support that. And that's what I would love to see. Oh, absolutely. Awesome work. Thank yeah. you for being here, Dr. Hampton. Awesome. Right, guys. If you're new to the carnivore lifestyle and you're feeling overwhelmed, lost, or just alone in your carnivore journeys, I welcome you all to join my community, the Steak and Butter Gang. We host 30-day carnivore challenges every single month in the community to make sure that all the members are inspired, well-informed, and on track. Every single week, I feature and bring on amazing carnivore doctors, including Dr. Tony Hampton, as well as Dr. Anthony Chafee, Dr. Robert Kilt, Coach Rebecca Heishman, 
Kitchen, and so many more amazing carnivore experts so that our members can ask their burning questions and get the help and troubleshooting they need. You also have regular access to learn and troubleshoot with my amazing team of carnivore coaches. Most of them are featured in today's video. All of these carnivore coaches are not only knowledgeable in every aspect of health and wellness applied through a carnivore diet, they are also incredibly loving and kind individuals. If you need help on your carnivore journey to get to your fat loss or healing goals, I welcome you guys to check out the Steak and Butter Gang challenges at the URL shown on the screen, sbgmeetup.com, or check out the description box for a clickable link. I hope you found today's discussion insightful and thought-provoking. Remember, the world of nutrition is ever-evolving, and it is essential to stay open-minded and also understand that there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all. The point of today's video was to share a perspective from people who are on a stricter carnivore diet. And of course, all of us have nothing but respect for Dr. Paul Saladino, who is a real trailblazer for so many of us. If you enjoyed this video, please do not forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more carnivore content. And as always, if you have any questions or topics you would like us to cover in future videos, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. Until next time, keep thriving on your carnivore journey, and I will see you in my next video. SBG out.